Well, hello there, watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time to see then what is making the headlines with the political editors of the Daily Mirror and The Sun, Pippa Crira and Harry Cole. They'll be with us right to, until just before midnight. So let's see then what's on those front pages, starting with The Guardian. A report being published overnight will say the government's early handling of the coronavirus pandemic represented one of the worst public health failures in UK history. On that same story, the Metro has the headline, Shamed Over Covid Chaos. Quoting the report, the Daily Mail says the elderly were treated as an afterthought during the pandemic. The Daily Mirror calls the belated implementation of the first lockdown the deadliest of delays. Meanwhile, The Telegraph hears the influential right-wing think tank, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, believes that further tax rises will be necessary to pay for health and social care. The Times says the Prime Minister has backed a multi-million pound bailout for industries feeling the impact of higher gas prices. The Daily Express leads with retailers pulling out all the stops to meet Christmas demand. While the Daily Star laments the possible loss of plastic ketchup bottles in favour of environmentally friendly glass ones. It's going backwards to go forwards, isn't it? Anyway, we will uh, we'll park that one for the moment. Uh, Pippa Crira and Harry Cole are here. And uh, many of the newspapers, uh, Pippa, including your own, The Daily Mirror, are uh, reflecting on this parliamentary report which is out overnight tonight about the initial stages and the government response to the pandemic. Uh, your paper, uh, part of the, it has to be said, excoriating coverage tonight, calling it the deadliest of delays. Tell us more. Well, we've gone in on the line in the report that um, the MPs criticised the government for the delay in bringing in the first lockdown, saying it led to tens of thousands of unnecessary deaths. But there are lots of other lines in this report, which is 150 pages long. Um, and when I read it later, uh, when I read it earlier, um, going through some of the criticisms over the handling of the social care sector, over um, the restrictions which were brought in the preparedness, health inequalities, I mean, the list goes on. And much of it um, are issues that we've discussed um, and thought about a lot over the last 18 months of the pandemic, not least because many of the evidence sessions were in public. There was obviously written submissions as well. And you'll remember the explosive testimony from the likes of Dominic Cummings. We had Matt Hancock, Sir Simon Stevens, the head of the NHS, and as well as the, the government's medical and scientific advisors. So much of the arguments that uh, the criticisms which are being uh, published in the report were rehearsed at those. So there's not very many surprises, but what really is striking is that this is the first time the overview has been brought together in this way. And as we all know, Boris Johnson has under, been under huge pressure to bring forward the, um, the independent public inquiry, which he said he wants to hold uh, not before next spring. And so this has almost been a sort of an alternative public inquiry, if you like, into those failings coming much sooner as it has. And it really, I think, just makes you sort of take stock and step back a bit and think, as we're emerging from the pandemic, and obviously the vaccines, the report also praises the vaccines rollout, um, really what a terrible, terrible 18 months it's been. Well, emerging from the pandemic with a massive caseload every day, it has to be pointed out. But you look at the coverage uh, overnight of the newspapers, the Metro 2, shamed over COVID chaos, and you think, it doesn't matter how much you sing about the vaccine rollout, what were they doing in those early months, Harry? Yeah, I think uh, I think Pippa's spot on. There isn't a huge amount of surprises. We've slightly gone around the houses a little bit on this, and we're going to be going around the houses on this for for years and years to come. And 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 so be it if that means that next time um, we are in a better position and better prepared. I think um, it's, it's a weird feeling of back in back in March 2020 when. Um, you know, so February, the sort of, you know, the, the, the stories were growing, the numbers were, you know, cases were lapping uh, at British shores and you looked across the pond to, uh, to places like Italy and you just sort of thought behind the scenes, surely there is someone dusting down a document that says, right, what do we do in this scenario? What is the plan? And I think one of the most startling um, parts of this, of this inquiry and parts of this uh, report is just how bad the planning had been 
for any of this. And it makes you really wonder, you know, what other contingency plans have we got for all sorts of horrific, awful things that could happen to this country, and God forbid they would, and are we in any fit shape or prepared for them if a pandemic, which was quite high on the list of possibilities of things that could happen, um, it was was so poorly prepared for? And that's what really chilled me about it. Um, you know, we can, we can go through the greatest hits of Dominic Cummings. They're all in there. You know, it's laid fairly bare how, how quite how much money was wasted on test and trace in those early days. You know, what is the point of having this massive testing capacity if there's no, if there's no, you know, if there's no tracing element that can actually use it to, to shut down? So that's that's all there. And, and as Pippa said, there is, you know, you know, the second half of the of the report makes much better reading about quite how um once the government has, you know, been battered and bruised and beaten around the head, um, it did become quite nimble uh, and did rip up the rules and did break all the procurement, you know, sort of notions of traditional procurement to get that vaccine going. Um, so I think, you know, it's a first crack at history. It's the first draft. Obviously, you know, dare I say, Jeremy Hunt might not be the biggest, most imper- impartial observer on this one, given he was the health secretary for 10 years, or well, nearly 10 years, in the run-up to the pandemic. But um, it needed to be done. We'll be hearing lots more reports like this. They'll go into much more granular detail. But, um, yeah, as the papers say tonight, the first draft of history is pretty damning. Yeah, to be, to be fair, I mean, both of these committees, the Health and Social Care Committee and the Science and Technology Committee, who came together to do this, they're both led by mm. Tories, though, aren't they? So it's, yeah, it's no, not I, exactly I, 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 the opposition at this. Go, go on, sorry. No, I'm just saying they haven't held their punches, and, and rightly so. However, I suspect the, you know, I, I, you know, I suspect the independent inquiry will go into far more detail. It did feel like a little bit like, actually, you know, I wouldn't say rush, but you know, it, it, it is, it does rattle through things quite quickly. Without, it's very much he said, she said, he said, she said, and this is what we think. Whereas actually, the the sort of how a public inquiry will work, where they have access to all the documents, to everything. Uh, will be will be a much more granular process, and probably given public inquiries of the past take years. Well, the uh, the Guardian also critical UK's COVID failings amongst the worst in history, uh, saying that ministers and scientists, in fact, took a fatalistic approach that exacerbated the death toll. And I remember when our uh, correspondent Stuart Ramsey was in the hospitals of Bergamo, the first time we'd seen properly inside a hospital, and the local mayor was begging the UK to listen and take notice. And at the time, what were the government doing? Where was Boris Johnson? You know, he was accused of being away for various weekends with his uh, his then fiance and. He's away now, obviously, as we go into the sort of supply and energy crisis. You know, where, where does the blame start and finish, Pippa? Well, ultimately, and it's you know, it starts and finishes at the top, doesn't it? But so one of the, I thought, one of the major omissions of this particular inquiry, which I think the public inquiry will attempt to rectify, is that the families of the bereaved. Uh, or the bereaved families um, of victims um, and those and survivors themselves weren't actually spoken to. And there's one particular campaign group which I know had conversations with Jeremy Hunt and and felt that they'd been assured that they would be heard at the inquiry. They obviously had very particular questions that they wanted answered, and um, they're you know feeling angry um, tonight that they weren't included and their voice wasn't heard. I mean, around about 150,000 people have died during this pandemic as a result of COVID. I mean, that's a massive number. And it's impacted millions of people's lives very directly because of that. And so it does seem to me like quite a big omission that, that um, you know, they, 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 haven't been, they haven't been spoken to. And they certainly want, felt that in terms of accountability, coming back to your question, Anna, in terms of accountability, it had to stop at the, at the door of the prime minister. And they were trying very hard to get a meeting with the prime minister, which finally happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, which is you know, kind of a first step, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not just about the, the sort of, you know, who's the, this committee made clear, that, um, this joint committee, that they didn't want to point fingers necessarily. But ultimately, I think not just the bereaved, but many people across Britain will expect somebody to be held accountable. Yes, and I know we'll talk about this, uh, you know, again, and as you say, over the weeks and, you know, when the when the public inquiry comes to, just wanted to show everyone the Daily Mail as well. Uh, the el- elderly were just an afterthought. Thousands died in care homes because of that. Clearly, there was a desperate need uh, to get people who could leave out of hospitals uh, to make them safer, but possibly not done the right way, not done with the appropriate testing and not with the PPE that was necessary. Just hurry very quickly on that then. 
Yeah, that was one of the crucial bits of actually of the of the sort of parliamentary uh, sort of fireworks that we had uh, and, and as, as this report was given, was taking evidence. Dom Cummings saying, you know, Matt, uh, Matt Hancock was decanting, you know, people into her care homes about protesting and misled the prime minister about it. Hancock coming out swinging, very firmly denying that. Note that Cummings promised to present evidence that he had written evidence for that that failed notably to, to present to the committee. So lots of loose ends still to tie up. But um, yeah, as I as as I said, you know, it's, it's a it's a it's a quick first draft of history, and I think there's a few more issues to be chewed over um, again properly in proper detail. Yeah, well, it's certainly dominating uh, tomorrow's newspapers, is it not? Harry Pippa, stay there. Lots more still to come, including has the government misjudged the public mood over gas prices? Talk more about that after this break. Well, welcome back. You're watching the Press Preview. With me now, Pippa Krira and Harry Cole. Welcome back to both of you. Um, Harry, let's go straight to your paper, your exclusive, it seems, as well. She says, check in the, check in the name. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is about uh, extra money on top of the already increasing energy bills. So take it away for us, if you can. Yeah, so as gas bills are soaring already, um, Boris Johnson, with the run up to COP uh, in just two or three weeks' time, the, the big climate change summit, he's under pressure and has to, he's promised to publish his big net zero green strategy. Now, unfortunately for the government, um, it doesn't rain, it pours. Within that, there's a plan to make electricity over the next 15 years a lot cheaper and gas a lot more expensive. So exactly the same time we're having a big old row about gas prices, up, up's going to pop the Prime Minister and Alok Sharma and Kwasi Kwarteng next week and try and remain part of the reality-based community while also suggesting that um, a gas bill should go up by £159. That's the current subsidy, uh, sorry, it's current green levies that are on electricity and they want to switch those over. Um, so there's lots of things in, the, in, the, in, this, in this strategy. All of them are going to be quite controversial, I suspect, to Tory MPs who don't want to rip out their gas boilers in the next 10 years. And it's not just consumers, is it? If we take a look at the times, it's also those businesses, many of them that are high energy and are thinking about scaling back production because of the increase in gas prices. Uh, what's the suggestion here, that they do need state loans, Pippa? Yeah, the discussions going on now between the Department of Business and the Treasury are about temporarily lending them, long term though, um, loans in order to cover the cost of rising gas prices. This is for energy intensive industries, things like steel and ceramics and chemicals and so on, um, that need a lot of gas. And many of the firms in the sectors have warned in recent days that they're potentially on the brink of shutting down, some of them permanently, which would be pretty devastating and potentially lead to thousands of job losses. The suggestion is the Prime Minister doesn't want to oversee that, so that he is prepared to back Kwasi Kwarteng over his Chancellor Rishi Sunak, who's more resistant about, about continuing the state splurge and supporting particular sectors. Um, and we should see more details of those loans in coming days. Does it, does it make it even more extraordinary that the Prime Minister was so dismissive uh, of these uh, latest difficulties in his address to the party conference last week, do you think, um, Harry? Especially as he's gone, yeah. and, uh, gone on holiday, the Mac cartoon is uh, one of those pointing that out. Yeah, a little bit. While well, this little bit feels like, well, the cat's away, the sort of mice are playing, and as, as Matt's tomorrow's got Dylan the dog in charge, while well, Whitehall sort of big beasts go tear strips off each other. I mean, there's an element of when could the Prime Minister ever take a holiday, and, and is the parliamentary recess of this week probably better than taking it in the middle of the G20 or in COP or in the run up to Christmas? So there's never a good time for these things. But um, I would say that even the even his most vicious of critics aren't being too po faced about the whole thing uh, right now. But as ever, you know, there's always going to be big beasts the numbers the numbers are so large now post covid with the terms of money flying around that actually you know the tempers are fraying because the matters are so serious and you know you'd have to slightly feel for rishi sunak who you know has just spent 407 billion pounds on covid recovery and is now you know the wolf is at the door again rattling that tin asking for more money i would hasten to add though for prime minister a lot of these energy intensive uh, industries are in red wall seats, ceramics, glass, and Stoke-on-Trent. 